So, uh, again, good to be with you. Uh, we're going to do today part two. We're looking at the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 to 3. Uh, the last time with you, we covered pretty well Revelation uh, chapter 1. And, uh, you know, I want to give you reasons, again, to read the book of Revelation. I might have said this the last time. I quite I can't remember. It's probably the most misunderstood, um, misinterpreted, and neglected book in the Bible. And it's unfortunate. As I travel around, so many people are ignorant of the book of Revelation. And it's it's really the only book in the Bible. I shouldn't say this, but it actually says, look at look at verse in yeah. Revelation chapter one. Blessed is he, this is verse three, who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written uh in it, for the time is near. There's real blessings in reading the book of Revelation. At the end of the book, in, in Revelation uh, chapter 22 uh, and 10, it says it gives you a blessing again. So it's a real blessing. And here's some of the reasons we should read the book of Revelation. One, it is uh, for the special blessing. But secondly, for the time is near. That's what it says in verse 3. Things that are about to happen are near, and they're certainly nearer today than they were uh, yesterday. And it's it it really gives us a good glimpse into the future. And fourthly, the um, the idea of the Book of Revelation is, of course, to look at the future, but it's also it starts out with judgment. We know the world is going to be judged. God is going to make it right. Jesus Christ, all authority is given to him on heaven and in heaven and on earth. And Jesus Christ is going to make this right. But in the meantime, we need to be prepared and judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Uh, we just went through the Lord's Supper. One of the best things that we can do to get ready for the Lord's Supper is examine ourselves, to get right, to be clean with God. And we, we understand that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But we're to examine ourselves. And before judgment takes place in the world, remember, it's going to start with us. And we look at it. Uh, this is what I want to look at this morning. And let, let's just read again verse uh, chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the, isle, on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard me uh, heard behind me a loud voice as of trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to, uh, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to uh, Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We're going to talk about that this morning. Then I turned to see the voice that I spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of that, the Son of Man. And the last time we went into that, who is the judge? Who is the one that's going to judge the world? Who is the one that will be at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ? It's not about our sin. It's a reward center ceremony or a loss of reward. And the last time I mentioned this to you, I believe, I talked about the seven 
uh, vital signs in your body. If you go to a physician, of course, they're going to order blood work. But some of the things that they do right in their office, you know, if you if you get a ho- office visit, there are seven what they call vital signs. Body uh, temperature, pulse rate, respiration rate, blood pressure, oxygen rate, your weight, and blood glucose. These are vital signs. And what I want to do in this message today, brethren, is I want to look at the vital signs that we see in these seven churches, and I want to make it very practical for you and for me. I know this was Christ going through uh, the lampstands, the seven churches, and uh, commending them or rebuking them. But I think we can look at this the way I, I did it is I look at it as vital signs for us as individuals. How do we know if we're right with God? We can go through these seven churches, and there's enough practical in there for you and for me. And the very first one is found in chapter 2. As you get into chapter 2 and chapter 3, you find Christ walking through these seven churches, the letters that were sent, that uh, John was to deliver these letters to the seven churches. And he said to the angel of the church of Ephesus in chapter two and verse one. And I don't want to go through too much detail. I want to look at a vital sign. And it said, look at verse four. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Ephesus had heart trouble. Ephesus had heart trouble. It was a vital sign. And for us, the, the that church, and perhaps in our own lives, we got everything right. We have our doctrine right. Um, we have our separation from the world right and things like that. But our hearts are not right. And, and, and Jesus uh, rebukes them. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. And this, they might have been busy in separation, but we're not busy in adoration. And I don't know if I even touched on this the last time. Uh, what can send you, Christian, into a ditch? is it's it's sort of a form of legalism and that is we we have our doctrine right and we're proud about that but our first love our our love for Jesus Christ isn't right the lord had to go to peter and say peter in john chapter 21 peter do you love me and Peter's like, he's annoyed almost. Like, Jesus, you know I love you. Don't you? Right? That conversation. Peter's saying, Lord, you know I love you. And, and, and Jesus repeats it three times. Do you really love me? If you do, feed my sheep. And this is one way, guys, that we can sort of measure a vital sign right here about love. If this is right with God, and we are right with God, and we really love God, we really love Jesus Christ, this will be right too. You cannot say you love Jesus, and you've got something against somebody, in the assembly, in your home, or whatever. Because when when we're right vertically, we're going to be right horizontally. We're going to be right here. We're going to love people. We're going to love the brethren. We're going to love the lost. 
we're going to have the can't help it. So I got to tell you about my first love, Jesus Christ. It's a vital sign. And, and one of the things is that, and, and you know, if you read the epistle to, I, I call it the shocking epistle of Galatians. It's shocking. Some of the language in Galatians is shocking. Have I become your enemy because I told you the truth, Paul said? And really, what, what, what was he saying? He said, who bewitched you? Who tripped you up? Who fooled you? Who got you into all this legalism and rules? And, and, and really, what Paul was saying, how did you get your eyes off Jesus so easily? You, you got saved. Jesus Christ saved you. Now you're into the law again. You're back. You're going back to your old ways. And, and, and brothers and sisters in the Lord, let me just encourage you this morning. God didn't save us with rules. He saved us by grace. And our whole motivation ought to be love. You know, I, I tell the story uh, of this. Rosie and I, when we were dating, um, I would talk about my dad all the time. And I knew her father. I didn't know him well, but I knew, I knew him. And um, Rosie never talked about her dad. I knew more about her dad than she did. True story. But when we were dating, I always talked about my dad. And one day, Rosie said to me, would you quit talking about your father? Because she, her, she didn't have that relationship with her father that I did. She hardly could believe that I, I was, you know, my obedience to my father didn't come out of fear. I wasn't scared of my dad. She was. She was scared of her father, terrified of her father. Rosie was very obedient. but. Uh, um, Rosie's dad was a taskmaster, a, a hard one. And, you know, when you got to know him uh, over the years, I had a lot of grace for him because of the way, you know, he was uh, left in Canada at seven year old, never saw his parents again. And, you know, he, he just grew up tough, tough, tough as nails. And uh, my dad, you know, I just love my father. And that's that's really beloved that's really what it's about it's not about oh it's not about rules it's about you know what i don't we just love jesus there is a name i love to hear i love to speak its worth it sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus and you know it's so good, really, isn't it, to come back to the Lord's Supper. And, you know, we go back to the cross. We, we focus in on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is such a good exercise to go back and to remember not only what he's done, but who he is. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. I want to fall more and more and more in love with him. You know what? You know, and, and some marriages are like that, like this, okay? I, I've done enough wedding ceremonies to tell you. They always, you know, you go down the road and they always, they haven't always been successful. But, you know, I, I you know, and this is a little bit funny, but it, it, it it's kind of sad. You know, um, I heard it once that, you know, a husband said, well, I told you I loved you 50 years ago. If anything changes, I'll let you know. You know, I mean, that's not love. Jesus loves us, and we love him because he first loved us. Oh, brethren, can we fall in love with him more and more and more and more? It's a vital sign. Do we have heart trouble? Do we have heart trouble? Smyrna, look at two and verse 9, the second vital sign. 
Uh, he says, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. You're rich. And this vital sign is pain. Do you know if you have pain, by the way, just to tell you something, medically, if you have pain, you have inflammation. Always. The church of Smyrna thought themselves to be poor. You know why? Because they were suffering. But Jesus said to them, you're rich. You know, what is our expectation in this world? In this world, you will have tribulation. Anybody tells you differently than that, run, forest, run, run. It's not true. We're in school. In school, you get tested. In schools, uh, you're going to go through trials. If we live for the here and now, then trials will make us bitter, not better. This is, this is an important, important thing. Trials are part of the Christian life. I never promised you a rose garden. Remember that song? And God has never promised us a rose garden. Peter said this in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through. As though something strange was happening to you. Rather, be very glad for these trials make you a partner with Christ in his suffering. That's why we're rich. If we take these trials, as James says, count it all joy, brethren, when thou goest through various trials, knowing, knowing that these trials develop patient endurance. These trials are for us. And, um, you know, uh, I think this, my son said this to me, we were talking about trials and he said, uh, most people ask, why did you do this to me? Rather than asking, why did you do this for me? Can we look at trials like that? It's hard, isn't it? Because I've had so many encounters with people Christians who have become bitter, completely discouraged with trials. And um, if you look at it, that this is not our home, we're only passing through, that we are to never give up. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, even though I just came back from a seniors conference, okay? And the first thing I said at the seniors conference, I was speaking, and the first thing I said, what am I doing here? I'm too young for you guys. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I was, our theme verse for the week was 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and it, it, in verse 16. Therefore, we never give up. We never give up, even though this outer body is perishing. It's wasting away. We're rusting out. But we never give up. And even though we're in trials, we, we, we understand that in God's eyes, we're rich. Even though we think we're terribly poor, we've lost, if you've lost a loved one or you, you've lost or, or you're suffering and the pain and your body is racked with um, pain and sickness, God says you're rich. Jesus says you're rich. 
You might think you're poor, but you're rich. And eternity will show it. The third vital sign is the uh, church of uh, Pergamos. And I, I, like I said, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. There's so much in there. But again, I want to bring out vital signs. The church at Pergamum had, a, had numbness. Uh, they had paresthesia. They, they didn't even realize it. Do you know that someone that has um, leprosy, what's so dangerous for them is leprosy, you lose all your feeling. You, you can't feel anything. And uh, in Pergamon, they, they, they were tolerating, it says, um, it says there in verse uh, 14, uh, but I have a few things against you because you, you, you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual uh, immorality. But, you know, when I look at the, the name Balaam, okay, when I look at that name, what do I think? I think of, you know, 1-800-CALL-A-PROPHET. You know, like, he, <laughs> dial a prophet. I mean, he was in it for money. And uh, he knew he couldn't curse Israel. You read that whole fascinating story where he was asked to curse Israel. He couldn't do it. But he had he he found a way uh, for uh, the Moabites to uh, they couldn't curse Israel, but they could corrupt Israel. And Christian, listen. A vital sign is whether we become numb to the world. It you know the world gets so bad around us. I I mean listen, Chris. It, let, let's just agree with one thing. Man, we live in a crazy world. We don't even know what, what bathroom to go into. It's crazy. I never thought in my lifetime I would see the nonsense that we see in this world. But you and I live in the world. And uh, the world is like gravity. It's a constant pull. Because we know the, uh, the God of this world. He takes the world and he, you know, he's got the, he's got the non-believers in his back pocket. But what he tries to do to us Christians is to get us to what? Conform to the world, to conform to it. And so um, he surrounds us with the world's appetites. He, he knows he can't, uh, just like Balaam, that he can't curse us. He can't. But he's going to try and corrupt us. And um, the world, my friend, listen. Jesus didn't take us out of the world. He could have. He sent us back into the world. That we would be Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. Bright and shining lights in a dark world full of perverse and depraved people. Remember, Jesus has sent us back into the world. Not to be corrupted by it. You know, to be, uh, you know, we a, a lot of Christians think, that tolerance is a virtue. It's not a virtue. We don't tolerate the world. The world is there not for our conduct. The world is there for our contacts. God wants us to not save the world. We're not going to save the world. You need to get into politics to save the world. Go after individuals in the world. I thank God there were people that were praying for me. I thank God that people, I remember people coming to my office 10 years before I was saved. 
and saying, Tony, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And it bothered me in a way. If they weren't such nice people, I think I would have told them off. Thank God. Go into the world and pour salt. Be a, be a, a preservative for uh, individuals. God wants us to be in individuals. The world is for contacts, not conduct. We don't get our conduct from the world. And uh, toleration is not a virtue. Now let's look at the fourth one. Thyatira. What is what is Thyatira is the worst church of all the sub. Jesus has more negative to say about Thyatira than anywhere else. And I'm just going to read a verse because it has this name in it. Verse 20, chapter 2, verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and to beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality. Now, look, I'm going to I'm going to take this name. When you think Jezebel, don't ever name your children, uh, your daughter Jezebel, please. <laughs> Jezebel, biblically, oh, what a terrible name. Right. But when I think of Jezebel. I, I, I as a vital sign. I think of a person, I think, you know, you're on your sick bed. But let me say this. If, when you think of Jezebel, what do you think of? You think of a woman that was just so corrupt and such a bad actor. But you know what I think of when I think of Jezebel? I think of Ahab, the king, who tolerated Jezebel. And you know what? Let me just say this and, you know, in a personal level, as I travel around, can I say what's missing in our world today? There's too many Ahabs. You know what we're missing? We're missing men. I, I don't blame ladies. I blame men. I don't blame Jezebel. I blame Ahab. You know what we're missing? We're missing men, godly men, men that would go out and say, I don't care what the world is doing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, this has just been my experience. And I look, it's not always true. So just please bear with me. When you see kids that go off the rails, and it can happen in any home. And they're not following Christ. More often than not, this is just what I'm, my experience, is daddy. Usually godly mommy. Or godly grandma. But no daddy. That was the leader the spiritual leader in the home. That's usually what I found. Or he was over the top in terms of rules. I tell you, my friend, we need men. I, you know, look at the world today. Why, why do you think, you know, I, I was in the prison ministry for 35 years. You know what it was? It was people in prison, almost invariably, no daddies in the home. Almost invariably. And they, and they got hooked on, um, you know, drugs and, and no daddy in the home. There was mommy, but no daddy. Look at the African-American population in the U.S. of A. It's craziness. No daddies in the home. But I tell you, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And a loving, a loving father who loves mommy. And the kids know one thing about daddy, boy, does he love mommy. 
And boy, when he says stop, he means it. And, he, you know, he doesn't just, you know, go to church. No, you come with me. We're going to church. The doors are open at the chapel. Let's go. I used to tell my kids, you want to eat? Yeah. <laughs> you know, do you want to eat? Yeah, well, follow me. Because <laughs> we go to church. And then we eat. You know, and, but hey, all I'm saying is when you look at Jezebel, think of Ahab. Who was he? He was milk toast. He didn't have a spiritual bone in his body. And his leadership was lacking. Sardis, got to go. <laughs> I always do this. I go down rabbit trails. And but I promise I'll finish. And um, so we we read about the church at Pergamos, and then he he uh, he uh, and Thyatira, and now we're going to look at Sardis. And this is a respiration rate. This is a vital sign. He says there, okay, look at three and one, okay. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know your works that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Their respiration rate. <laughs> you know, you take a pulse to see if someone is dead. Ah, actually, you do this. <laughs> are they breathing? Right? And this church, they thought, see, it was the opposite of um, Smyrna. They thought they were rich. But Jesus said, no, you're poor, man. You're poor. And, and, and why is that? Uh, because they were complacent. They were comfortable. They were content. Listen, Christianity is always, it's never static. The status quo has got to go. And if we examine our lives, a lot of us, we got the same old habits, the same old things, and, you know, we often make it, oh, it's just the way I am. No, 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 Christianity isn't like that at all. Christianity is growth, always growing, always, always growing. Read your Bible and pray every day, and you will grow, 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 grow. We should be growing. Uh, uh, we should be productive and um, not short-sighted and blind. Don't be complacent. Don't be comfortable. Don't be content with where you are. God godliness with contentment is great gain, but not with our, you know, is the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Is that is Tony Martin growing? Is the the fruit of the spirit? Am I more loving, more self-control, more and more and more? The church at um, Sardis, they thought they were good. And God's Jesus said, you're dead. I can hardly get a pulse out of you. You're not growing. Nike said this. Commercial. Never forgot. It. Life is short. Play hard. What is Christianity? Life is short. Quit playing. Yeah. <laughs> Number six. The church at Philadelphia. And this, and by the way, I think I might have told you this last time. Do you know that they're looking, they're really looking at implementing two more vital signs. Okay, I read to you the seven vital signs. They're actually looking at two more. It, it hasn't been implemented yet, but these are these are really telltale of your um, your health. You know what one of them is? Your grip strength. Isn't that interesting? Gripping. If you they can measure your grip. Have you ever had that done? Where you just measure your grip strength? Well, they can tell you if you got a real weak. Uh, or, or uh, grip strength, 
eh, you're probably going to leave the planet sometime soon. Seriously. You know what the other one is? Go on the ground and nothing around you to help you and try and get up. It's <laughs> not as easy as you think, especially when you get my age. But that's a, a they're, they're, they're thinking about implementing these as a vital sign. You know, wouldn't it be interesting? You went to your doctor's office and he said, get on the floor. <laughs> now get up. Yikes. Okay, anyway. So here's the Church of Philadelphia measuring the grip strength. You know what he said to them in uh, in uh, Revelation uh, chapter uh, 2 again to the Church of Philadelphia? Uh, what does he say? That, um, oh, excuse me, I meant in chapter 3. Uh, chapter 3 and um, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast. You know, he... Uh, Jesus had nothing negative to say about uh, the church of Philadelphia. You know what he said as a vital sign? Hold on. You know, Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 at the end of his life. Didn't he say this? He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. Oh, Christian, Christian, listen to me. Do you know how many people have started out so well in their Christian life and ended up so poorly? And, you know, we don't have to go far in Revel in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, right after Paul says these things, right after. He, he, he goes, he talks about Demas. Demas. I don't want to be no Demas. He started out so well and finished so poorly, having loved this present world, Paul said. Oh, I don't want to be like that. Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia, hold on, hold on, Christian, hold on. You know, I want to finish well. Get the truth, Proverbs 23 and 23, get the truth and never sell it. Christian, you have the truth. You have the way, the truth, and the light because of Jesus Christ. Hold on. Paul, his, his biggest fear, he had the fear of the Lord, but his biggest fear was that he would be a castaway, that he wouldn't make it to the end, being faithful to the end. And then when he got there, he said, yep, I made it. And the crown, he said, the crown is awaiting him. The crown of perseverance. The crown, I want to get that. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The seventh one, let me finish with the seventh vital sign. It's your body temperature. You know what? You know what half and half is good for? Coffee. Not for your Christian life. We all know about the church of Laodicea and Jesus said, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold, but I can't stand lukewarm. And I don't want to be lukewarm, do you? I don't want to be cold either, but I don't want to be lukewarm. Because it said, Jesus said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And goes along a lot with, uh, with uh, the church at Ephesus. Half and half is only good in coffee. Even then, I like my coffee black. I like it hot. But Jesus said, what's your temperature, you know? And the, on the road to Emmaus, what did they say? They didn't even know it was Jesus. The resurrected Jesus Christ, they didn't even recognize him. He said, as a matter of fact, they said to him, you know, almost with scorn, hey, where have you been? What planet have you been living on? You didn't hear what happened in Jerusalem today? Oh, but Jesus revealed himself in the breaking of bread. He brought them through a Bible study, imagine, to teach them that, that the Christ had to suffer. 
Imagine being in that Bible study. And Jesus, and, and, and you know what they had to say? Weren't our hearts burning within us? How sweet are your words to my taste? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 119, 103. My friend, your love for the scriptures is directly proportional to your love for Jesus Christ. Your love for the scriptures are directly proportional to your love for Jesus Christ. Oh, I love thy word. I love thy word. Is Jesus on the outside, you know? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and perhaps there's someone today, we use it for salvation, and I've used it many, many a times for salvation, even though it's really written to the church of, of um, Laodicea. But it's a great gospel verse because God is on the outside knocking at your heart, and only you can open the door to him. But you know what? In the real context, it's Jesus is on the outside, even though he really isn't, but because he's not at home in our hearts. That's what Ephesians chapter 3 is. You'll never really understand the power of God unless Jesus is comfortable in our hearts, meaning he gets the key to every door in our hearts. And he feels comfortable. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, and it'll always, always bring us to Christ. Always. And let's fall in love with him more and more and more and more. I don't want to be lukewarm, you. Maybe we become lukewarm. Those are the seven vital signs I wanted to talk to you about this morning. Finishing up from Revelation 1, 2, 3. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you. You are so good to us, oh God. Thank you for your precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for these dear folks, Lord. Would you bless them, honor them? Thank you for them, Father. I pray that something that was said today would really, really speak Two hearts, and there may be one person there. I don't know, Father, but you do. There's one person there, perhaps, that has never really trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've never, they don't know what that relationship uh, that uh, is so available to us, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, Father, I pray. I pray for each and every one. And, Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.